good evening. Can we stand to our feet and go into worship tonight? Are you glad to be in the house of the Lord? Oh, come on tonight. Let's put our hands together. Lift our hearts and worship to Him. Searching for, we want you and nothing more. Let your glory fill the space. We're alive in your presence. Come on, everybody, sing that out. It's your heart we're searching for. We want you and nothing more. Let your glory, let your glory. of the Lord tonight. I'm thankful for his never failing love and that he always promises that he will never leave us alone, but he will always come for us every single time. Aren't you thankful for that tonight? Even if, whenever we didn't deserve it, he still came for us. Let's just lift our worship to him tonight, our gratitude. Before I spoke a word, you were singing over me You have been so, so good to me Before I took a breath You breathed your life in me You have 
been so, so kind to me. Come on, if you know it, sing it out. Oh, the overwhelming, never-ending, reckless love of God. Oh, it chases me down, fights till I found these the 99. I couldn't earn it, I don't deserve it. on the ground and can hardly walk and she comes to Jesus and she says within herself if I can just touch the border or the hem of his garment I know I'm going to be made clean you see that woman surrendered 
because in that day and time, if this woman had an issue of blood and she came into public and she came in around other people, she may even get stoned for that. But here's what she said. I know that I've heard about the love of Jesus and I believe it in my heart that if I just get to him and have just, just the bottom of his hem, it's gonna be enough for me to have exactly what I need. Sometimes I think we're suspect when we're in the middle of a situation and it's not what we need. It's in that time of between crawling to get to Jesus and in that time before reaching for that hymn and it's in that time before the blood flow stops and she sees that healing take place that in that time frame, sometimes I think that we're suspect of God. Does God really even want to do this? Does God really even look and care about what I'm going through? And there's times in our situations that it may even look like it didn't answer correctly. I've been talking to a lady at work who was in a court situation. She laid everything out on the line and knew exactly what she needed God to do and began to pray and ask us to pray for that. She went to the first court hearing and it looked like everything was falling apart. And she came back to me and said, I was believing him. I said, no, let's change that. I am believing him. And she said, but it didn't come out like I wanted. I said, it's not over. Do you have another court date? She said, yes, I've got one more, but look, it's not even going the way I, I want it. I'm not even getting close to what I know I need to get. I said, then just keep saying, I know God is faithful. I know he loves me enough. And I told her, I said, he's got your back. He loves you too much, too much to let you go through this and come out not ahead. So when she went back to the second court date, the other person's lawyer actually was better for her than her own lawyer. And the other person's lawyer began to say, look, you're not even asking for enough. And I'm sure the other person sitting there was like, wait a minute, you're, on, you're supposed to be on my side. And God turned the table all the way around for her to the place where when she walked out of there, she had more than what she even asked for when she went in. Because God's a big God and he loves us. And even though God is a big God, he's so personal just with each and every one of us. He knows exactly what you need and his love is so strong there that if it's, if it's not what we're seeing and we know that we wanna see, it's not over. And God says that he would even bless us more abundantly than we can even think or imagine within ourselves. She imagined the best case scenario that could be for her and asked for that and yet came out. She said, I, I didn't even know I could get more than that. I wasn't even thinking more than that. And I began to tell her, that's the love of God that God has for you. He loves you. Don't ever stop in the middle of a situation and think that God doesn't love you enough or that God's not on your side enough. God will turn the other person's lawyer on your side to get you where he wants you to be. It's just a matter of knowing the love of God is so strong that he's gonna have your back. He's not gonna quit until exactly what he wants for your life is what takes place. He loves us that much. No, the overwhelming, never-ending, reckless love of God. Oh, it chases me down, fights till I'm found, leaves the 99. I couldn't earn it, I don't deserve it, still you give yourself away. Father, I thank you so much. God, I thank you that you are always looking for us. You're always looking for out for us. And even whenever we don't have the strength to fight for ourselves, or maybe we don't even have the know-how, you still fight for us, God. And so, God, tonight in this place, I just pray for my brothers and sisters that they continually encounter your love in all kinds of ways, just like as Lisa was just saying in every situation to recognize your reckless abandonment of your love that will go out of your way when no one else will. You always come for us. We thank you tonight, God, for that. I thank you, Lord, that you promise us you'll never leave us or forsake us. We bless you tonight, Father. We thank you so much for bringing us into this place and we open up our hearts and open up our ears to receive everything that you have for us tonight. In Jesus' name, and all God's people said, amen.
and amen. Can you just love on the people around you right now? Give them some of that reckless love tonight. Thankful for reckless love, aren't you? <laughs> so grateful tonight for him. So grateful for you all. Thankful for what God's doing in this place. I encourage you, if you do have a little one, they are going to be dismissed to Kids Club tonight, as well as uh, Expression Student Ministries. If you're a teenager, you're more than welcome to go across into the auxiliary sanctuary to join with student ministry tonight. How many of you all are thankful to be in the house of the Lord this evening? Oh, it's such a good... It, I'm excited about this season of what God's doing, and it just always feels good to get to come and be together on a Wednesday night here. I'm just thankful for you all. Um, very quickly, is there anybody that's never been to Expression Church? Uh, can you raise your hand? Maybe this is your first time. I can't... Okay. Nice to meet you all. You've got Rock, this is... Yeah, give him a hand. So glad that you're here this evening. This is Rocky Horner. He's part of our welcome team. We have a large welcome team. If you've been here more than once, welcome to the welcome team. And we're glad that you're here tonight. If you would fill that card out, and at the end of service, if you'll give it back to us at the information table, we'd love the opportunity to get to know you better. Um, and if you've never filled out one of those, it's a great, solid way to get to know, um, it, a great way to get to know everybody and keep yourself connected Oh, oh, I was like, oh, well, all right then. I, it's hard. For those of you watching by Facebook, somebody just yelled out. Actually, Pastor Kevin's wife, Lisa, just yelled out, we have another baby. And we're like, what? <laughs> no. Amy, Amy and DJ just had their baby. And oh, they're so excited. Oh, so awesome. Congrats, congrats, congrats. Very excited about that. Love new life. It's exciting. So uh, we're going to grow the church one way or another. <laughs> That's a good way to grow it. So we're very excited for a healthy, a healthy delivery, healthy baby boy, correct? Yeah, awesome. So it's wonderful. Tonight, we're so glad that you're here. And we, are, we do want to receive our tithe and offering this evening. So if you've come prepared to give, uh, let's go ahead and do that. I want to thank you so much because what God's doing um, just within our church family is just amazing. The, the blessings, the miracles, and all the things that we're getting to see. I also want to encourage you as we join in and worship, uh, what we do is we create an atmosphere and a culture and a family together. And I believe that finances are another way because how many of you all know that scripture that talks about wherever your treasure is, that's where your heart is? And so God, I believe, speaks so mightily through our finances. And I'm so thankful that He does. So tonight, there's a, logistically speaking, uh, there's a few ways that you can give. Underneath of every chair are offering envelopes. They're white. They say Expression Church. If you're making out a check, make it payable to ECH. And then also, if you're giving cash, it doesn't matter if it's a dollar. It doesn't matter if it's a thousand. It does not matter. Make sure you put your name on that and put it in that offering envelope because you are more than a number. You are a name. Amen? So we want to make sure that you have ownership of that. So tonight, and then also another way to give is through text giving, which is what a majority of our church family gives. And all you do is you send the text message of what you'd like to give in its numerical value, whether it be like five, if you're given $50, you just type five zero, and then you send that to the number 84321. That's 84321. And all you have to do is hit send. You only set up an account one time. And then if you do it again, every, every, after you set up the account, you don't, have to do, you don't have to go through all those steps again. So are you prepared to give tonight? Amen. All right. Let's raise our offerings to the Lord. And we do this every time. If you're in a place financially where you are not able to give, to be able to sow into the ministry, I want to ask you to raise your hand because we believe that God will meet you right where you are, that he's going to bring you to a place of fruition of the promises of God. So let's raise our gifts to the Lord tonight. Father, I thank you so much. From the bottom of my heart, I say thank you. God, we offer up our thanksgiving first and foremost and our humility and say, Lord, we would be nothing without you. 
You are the one who rises us up in the morning and lays us down at night. You're in our comings and our goings. But God, right now in this moment, we pause and we say thank you for what you've blessed us with in our finances, in our monetary realm, Father. And we ask right now, Lord, as we begin to sow together, that you would be in this harvest. We're bringing it into this storehouse that you have called us to steward over. And we say thank you and we do not take it lightly. We thank you for what you're doing. And right now we give into this storehouse. We sow together into fertile, good, healthy soil. In Jesus' name. And all God's people said, amen and amen. Be blessed tonight as you give. I have a couple things I want to tell you about that I want to make sure specifically that everybody uh, has the opportunity to hear about this. Uh, we are celebrating graduates this Sunday, and again, if you have not had the opportunity uh, to get to fill out a survey for your graduates, someone who might be graduating high school, a, a college, a program, a, a, even a trade school, we're very thankful for those things. Uh, we love the opportunity to get to celebrate that. So if you have a chance, fill out one of those surveys on the table in the Grand Hall. Get it back to us. We'd like to have it back no later than Friday, if possible. It would be wonderful to have that. And then also, Memorial Day is coming up, and I'm so thankful for our men and women that have served in the armed forces. Many have given their lives. But what we're going to be doing on Memorial Day, which is the 26th, uh, directly after service, we are going to be having a cookout. And one of my favorite things in the whole wide world is the smell of hamburgers and hot dogs being grilled. So what we're going to do is we are going to start grilling and make everybody in here have to endure the smell until Pastor Kevin stops preaching. We will see how spiritual y'all are. <laughs> I know me. I would last just about five minutes and I'd start sneaking to check. But here's the thing that we, we want to just... Uh, encourage everybody to come enjoy and it's going to be kind of an eat and go thing if you have somewhere to be uh, it's a great way just pick up some things grab you some a hot dog hamburger some chips and a can of coke and just enjoy yourself because it kicks off our summer season and so we're uh, make sure that you are uh, keeping up on the app on facebook like the church's uh, facebook page not for likes and all those things, but the summer season, how many of you all know what the summer season of expression looks like when it comes to expression parties? Yeah. Okay, for those of you who have never been to an expression party, you're in for it. It's going to be awesome. So keep up on Facebook, on the app, and then also this little time before Pastor Kevin comes to preach, we're going to try our best to make sure that everybody knows what's going to be happening and when. So we're very, very excited about that and want to make sure everybody stays involved. Are you ready for the word of the Lord tonight? Yeah. All right, Pastor Kevin. Well, let's see what we can do here. <clears throat> I'm going to take us on a little refresher tonight, uh, maybe a remedial course, if, uh, if you don't mind. Um, sometimes when you get in the middle of church and life and you uh, join church, become a part of church, uh, whatever it might be, um, sometimes you uh, kind of forget what you're a part of, you know what I mean? And life starts taking down a different course, a different course of action. And you kind of have to go back to the Bible to kind of bring back some realities that sometimes you have, we have a tendency to overlook when we just are living life, going to church, doing church, doing life. And um, I'm not talking about just studying, but I'm talking about coming back to the, the jerking back into the reality of what this thing's really all about, Okay. So tonight, I want to talk just briefly about the kingdom, the kingdom of God. And it seems like a foreign concept to us because we live in a, a democracy, with, you know, a republic, where we vote on everything. But I, I really want to help, help us to understand something. Because you can, you can get saved, you can become a part of the church, be in ministry, and um, know God, but not understand kingdom, uh, uh, the aspect of kingdom, and miss the totality of what you're a part of, and frustration can really enter in to your life when you're trying to press into something 
um, without having some understanding of the kingdom. Let me give you an example. Um, I'm gonna read some scripture here in just a minute in Matthew chapter six, but let me first give you this. There was a guy who lived in the United States years ago <clears throat> and worked for a company and uh, very successful in the company. Uh, had him and his wife had kids. And um, when he was working for this company, he owned a house. I think he lived in Atlanta, somewhere down in the Georgia area. He um, owned a home, was... Uh, American citizen. He um, kind of active in politics to some degree, uh, at least was an advocate of uh, some agendas that he had uh, appreciated. So what he did was <clears throat> he was very you know, active in the community. So he owned a property, owned his house, and was a business owner or part of the company. Uh, I'm sure he owned stock in that company uh, as, a, as an employee because he was a, it was a Fortune 500 company. So very successful. Kids were in school, uh, doing well, playing sports, lots of extracurricular activities. His wife was a part of the PTO or PTA or whatever they call them nowadays. And she was just very, very normal, everyday American, you know, success story. And when he was, um, you know, doing well, I think he, uh, you know, his property values was, uh, was appreciating going up. Uh, stocks were rising in his assets, heading towards retirement, and put back money towards his retirement, and um, was just doing well. One day he gets a call, and the company that he worked for, because he was so successful and doing really well, asked him to go and become, relocate his family, and pioneer a part of this company to a place, a country called Morocco. And Morocco was not a republic, he didn't vote. Morocco was a, was, is, was a monarchy, a kingdom. So <clears throat> he thought, well, you know, very lucrative transition going from here to there because the money was incredible. Um, you know, he would be a, a visiting there quite a bit, still have his residence here in America and all that. So he goes to Morocco <coughs> and he realizes that the king over there, the kingdom, that government did not function like the United States did. So he comes over and he says, hey, you know, I'd like to be a part of this you know, country. We kind of love it here, or learning to love it. And um, how, do you, how do you vote? And they kind of laughed at him and said, you don't, you don't vote here. The king has all to say. Well, I, what if I want to buy some property here and build a house or, well you will never get a title to that property because the king owns the land. Okay, well, what, what are the rules? How do, I, how, do I, uh, how, do I, how do I do this? And he said, they said, you basically live by the will of the king. And he goes, okay, then how do I vote on the king when the king comes up for election again? He says, well, you don't vote on the king because the king is never elected or voted out. The king is born through a birthright to the throne. He says, so I don't have ever a shot. No, he goes, and you talking to the guy, he says, you don't have a shot. He goes, wasn't born in that family. He says, so it's always gonna be up to that family line to own it, to understand it, to run it. Yeah, it's always gonna be that way. He says, what happens if you get a good king? He said, good things happen to the people. What happens if you get a bad king? Bad things happen to the people. What if there's empowerment? People get empowered. What if there's corruption? You'll see that there is. So he had a hard time trying to figure out how to go from a place here that appeared to have so much freedom <clears throat> where you have opinions and how to go there. So he, he went to his pastor and he said, gosh, I'm really struggling with this whole thing. And this pastor looked at him and said, well, it's just like the kingdom of God. And he said, well, what are you talking about? He goes, what do you mean the kingdom of God? He goes, I know the kingdom of God, the church, heaven, kingdom of God is heaven. And the pastor looked at him and said, no, the kingdom of God is not heaven. The kingdom of God is a realm of influence, a realm and a domain in the, in the realm of the spirit. And he went, I'm not following you. He said, I've joined this church. 
He said, well, no, we appreciate it too. He said, I tied to this church. He goes, no, we appreciate that too. He said, so what are you talking about the kingdom? I mean, what in the world is, the, how is that different than being a part of a local, I've taken membership here. I've gone through the membership classes. My kids have been baptized here. He went through the whole list of things. He said, and I come to the business meetings every quarter and I vote. He said, yeah, but that's not how it's done in the kingdom. God was not voted in and God can never be voted out. And the only reason that Jesus made it to the throne was because he was born into it through the bloodline as the son of the father. So he starts explaining this to this guy and he's going, I've never heard anything like this. No, you've heard it, but it's never been put all together. See what I'm saying? So he begins to tell him and teach him. He said, listen, he said, let's go back and look through the scriptures. <laughs> he said, what was John the Baptist? He said, the, 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 in Matthew, I think it was Matthew 16, 16, I think it was, or Luke 16, 16, it says this, it says, up to John the Baptist, the law and the prophets were preached. But since then, it was the message of the kingdom. So the, the message shifted when John the Baptist started preaching, repent, the kingdom of God is at hand. But unless you understand the kingdom of God is at hand, you'll think that repentance is just getting some old stuff off of you and getting a fresh start to live in a brand new way. So he says, okay, I, I get that. John the Baptist preached the message. He said, now look, let's look at Jesus' message. He started reading Jesus' words. So Jesus started preaching and said, hey, repent. He said, the kingdom of God is at hand. The kingdom of God is at hand. When you see me, the kingdom of God with you. You're with me, the kingdom is with you. And he started preaching about this kingdom and all through Jesus' words was the, the kingdom. So they started comparing how much Jesus preached the cross versus the kingdom. It was the kingdom. Way outweighed how many messages on the cross because he always told the people about the cross was this, I've come to die, they're gonna crucify me. It was a statement of fact. But the message of the kingdom was, you gotta get this. Jesus dies, buried, and, arise, and raises from the dead, <coughs> goes and ascends to heaven, here comes the disciples. Peter, James, John, all of them. Philip, all throughout the book of Acts, the message that they preached was the kingdom. The kingdom of God was preached. The kingdom of heaven was preached. The God's influence was preached. So what is that look like in the reality of our lives? Because it's more than just joining a church. It's more than just repenting of your sins. What he's saying is change your mind because what appears that used to be very far away is now available to you today, okay? God himself was king, king of heaven, and God ruled in the spirit as king. Nobody elected him. He was there before, he'll be there after in the heavens. But God, what he wanted to do was expand that kingdom and have a planet here on the earth called earth. When he did, he set you and me to be kings in the earth. So he could be king of kings, because every king is also called Lord. He would see these guys when he went to Morocco, he would say, man, they address the king, they call him Lord. Well, yeah, the king is the Lord over there. Because why? The king owes it all. All the land is titled to the king. So this guy was having this difficult, so they started going through this whole scripture and finding out the message that Jesus, John the Baptist, Jesus, the apostles, even when Paul became the lone messenger to all the, the Gentiles, right? The message was the kingdom. The kingdom of God is at hand. The kingdom of God is at hand. But if we don't have a frame of reference or ever living in a kingdom, it's difficult for us as American citizens to really understand what Jesus is trying to say, okay? It's foreign to us. Every kingdom has, <coughs> there's several things, but I'm gonna give you six. To be a kingdom, you have to have, number one, you have to have people. 
you're not a king unless there's a king over people, right? You gotta have a king. The king is, gotta have people. You have to have territory. Otherwise, there's no king. There must be a king or a queen. You have to have constitution or rules, laws or bylaws or something to function within government. And you have to have currency. Now, there's a whole list of other things, but I'm gonna talk about these first. Now, let's go to Matthew chapter six. Take heed that you do not alms before men to be seen of them. Right now, we're getting a glimpse into the heart, the character, the laws, the culture of God's kingdom. He's bringing this intention of God, Jesus is, to all the people that are here on the earth. And he's trying to explain to them how heaven really is in God's rule and domain. And he comes back and he says, take heed that you do not alms before men to be seen of them. Otherwise, you have no reward of your Father which is in heaven. <laughs> Therefore, when thou doest thine alms, do not sound a trumpet before thee, as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets, that they may have glory of men. Verily I say to you, they have their reward. Let's stop right there for a second. But here's what it's saying. It's saying, one characteristic in the Constitution, the laws of God, the heart of God, the mind of God, the intent of God, in the, the, the kingdom of God, God's rule and domain, God's sphere of influence, one of the characteristics is, and chapter six says this, don't do things to be seen, do things out of your heart and don't care what man thinks, right? If you're not careful, you can get it caught up in that kind of thing. If this is a secret or a glimpse into the culture. So let me just take it this way. If this guy goes to Morocco, from the United States, and he goes over there and he says, and he's talking to somebody in the kingdom, in the kingdom of Morocco, and he looks at the guy and the guy says, let me give you a little insight. Whatever you do, don't give away things for free and give alms to people and, and give money to the poor just to be seen. That's not what we do here, right? That man would have to make an adjustment. The first thing he'd have to do is check his heart and say, well, gosh, do I really do that in America? Do I just give it to be seen? Am I just trying to make a name for myself? Is my motivations pure? Am I, am I worried about what other people? But if I'm here in this area, this king, this place, they don't do it that way. So to repent means I have to change how I do it here to how they do it there. That's repentance. Make sense? So God says, Jesus is telling the disciples, if you give to be seen, change your mind. Don't do it that way. Do it to not be seen. If you make the switch in your heart, then you've gone from the kingdom of the world and you've just now pressed into the kingdom of God in giving. Does that make any sense at all? Amen. That's important because repentance is so subtle. It's just a matter of denying one behavior and picking up another. Right? And the switch is the switch in the heart. Let's keep going. Verse three. But when thou doest alms, let not thy left hand know what thy right hand is doing, that thine alms may be in secret. <coughs> and thy father which seeth in secret himself shall reward thee openly. Now we're gonna talk about prayer. We just talked about giving. Don't give to be seen. Give out of your heart. Who cares if people know how much you give, right? We're not doing it to, 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 to make a name for ourselves. If you are, you're in the wrong kingdom. Now he's gonna shift from giving to prayer. Watch this. This is a perfect analogy to, 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 to grow up and mature through this process. And when thou prayest, thou shalt not be as the hypocrites are, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and in the corners of the streets that they may be seen of men. See. Have you noticed the first two, two or three verses of this chapter was talking about giving seen by men? Now we're talking about praying seen by men. You are not, the kingdom of God does nothing 
for attention, to draw attention to you. It's all hidden in motivation of heart. For they love to pray standing in the synagogues and in the corners of the streets that they may be seen of men. Verily I say unto you, they've received their reward. Verse six, but thou, when you pray, enter into thy closet and when thou shut your door, pray to the Father which is in secret and thy Father which seeth in open shall reward thee openly. So when you're praying and you're asking the Lord, you're privately connecting with him because the attributes of prayer in the communication in the kingdom is God, this is between me and you. I'm not doing anything to be seen by people. We good? Giving and prayer. Then he says this, but when you pray, use not vain repetition. Can I give you a vain repetition? It doesn't have to be, but it can be. In Jesus' name, amen. In Jesus' name, amen. That is not a tag, that's a position. In the kingdom. If you're saying it to try to get a result and you think that's gonna get the result, you're outside the kingdom trying to get in. But when you're in the kingdom, you're confident you don't have to say it because you're already in it. Right? I'll tie this together just a moment. But when we pray, use not vain repetition, as the heathen do, for they think that they shall be heard for their verbose and wordy prayers. Be not therefore like them, for your Father knoweth what you have need of before you even ask. After this manner, pray ye, here we go, our Father, which means you're not alone. You are in a family, right? You're a part and connected to the family of the God. So if you're saying our Father, and we know God is the King of all kings, and the Lord of all lords, he's letting you in. When you're in the kingdom and you make the mind shift to the kingdom, the king now is your father. You're not approaching him as king of kings and lord of lords. You're approaching him as your father, which is the king of kings and the lord of lords. There's a difference. I had a guy tell me one time, he said, man, his dad had passed away and he was in a mess financially, and he needed a couple hundred thousand dollars just to get himself out of the business situation he was in. It was a mess. And he came to me and he said, God, I need prayer, man. I need, it was just, it was just eating him alive. It was a real dire situation. So we were praying, right? And he looked at me and he said, man, if my father was still alive, I wouldn't have any problems. Man, he'd jump in and help me. And I said, oh, let me show you a scripture. If your earthly father being wicked desires to give you good gifts, how much more of your, does your heavenly father? The question is, have you made the shift from church that he's Lord of Lord and King of Kings only into the kingdom, which means he's your father? Do you see him as your father or is that a title that he has to carry as reverence? Make sense? When you can approach him as father, that he, you are his son. And it's just like that between you two. The guy goes to Morocco and he come, he's talking, he's starting to meet people. He's in the, starting to get in the community. He meets the son of the king, which is gonna be the heir to the throne one day. So his dad, this, is the, this man, wants to introduce him to the king. He says, I want to introduce you to the king. You're coming over here working for this company. You're going to be a part of this community. I want to, I want to introduce you to the king. So he takes him in. There was a protocol to enter into the place for the king for everybody else. But he was with the son. So guess what he did? He had his own access into the king because the king was the king to everybody 
in the, in the, in the elements of the community, in, this, in the country. But to him, he was his father. So he walked in as he was supposed to be there. And it didn't matter what kind of business was on the king's agenda that day. When the son walked into the to his father, there was immediate attention. And he brought the, the man, young man in, and he said, here, I want to introduce you to my father. He's the king of this country. And he got immediate access to the king because of the son. That'll preach. Right? And once you realize Jesus is the first son, or the, the only begotten son, but you're brought in as a son, adopted a son with Jesus, you now have access to the king as your father. But as long as you still see yourself as an alien and a foreigner, so the shift isn't for the government to change, it's for you to repent. See it different. And when you start seeing it different, you start acting different. And when you go to the Father, it won't be as God, I'm real suspect that you're willing to do this for me. You're gonna, you're gonna see it, watch this, as we go through this. I'm real suspect, God, if you're gonna do, I'm not sure if it's your will to do this or not. When you know the Father, and you know how good your dad, just like the guy said, and if my dad was still alive, he would have given me this money and got this off my back. And I said, then, do you think your father's holding out on you to teach you a lesson? You're suspect of him because you can't see him. And you're not sure. And you're also knowing you created the mess and you're afraid he won't bail you out of the mess to teach you a lesson. But would your dad have bailed you out of the mess? He would have. Right. And it wasn't your first mess, was it? No, it wasn't my first mess. But guess what? He still bailed you out, right? Why? Because you're his son. <clears throat> I'm preaching better than you're listening. I can promise you this is good stuff. This is life changing. This is what it's all about. Everything else fits inside of it. We try to make the kingdom fit inside of what everything else we do. But even your worship, I, I, I can't go on for that. I'll, I'll get on some rabbit trails. After this manner, therefore pray, our father, you're part of a family. He's your father, their father, our father, and the king is your father. Which where? Is in the spirit realm, in the heavenly domain, the unseen. Our father, which is in the unseen. My father is in the unseen. Your father is in the unseen, right? And your name is hallow. It's separate, it's holy, it's set apart, it's sanctified. There's none other like it. See, the king of Morocco, which I don't know his name, but the king who was in Morocco, when the, the guy walked in, there's only one, that name was tied to that king. And when people said the guy's name out there, people knew that was the king. Your father's name is hallowed. It's holy, separate. Set apart, none other, none like it. Other. Jehovah, go ahead, next verse. Your kingdom, look at this. Thy kingdom come, what? Your father, which is in the unseen, our father, we're in this together, is in the unseen. Your kingdom, your domain, your realm of influence, your constitution, your thoughts, your will, your intentions, what you wanna see happen, let it come. Your will be done in earth. This is the earth. Yes, we wanna see it out here in the earth, but we gotta see it here in the earth. Let it be done in here as it is in the unseen. As it is in, the, in, a, in a realm that I can't see, let it be done here that I can see. Let the unseen and the seen come together. Let there be no separation. Let there be no distinction between the two. Let them be seamless. So if healing is in the unseen, oh God, let healing be seen here. If prosperity is seen here, let it be seen here. Right? Right? We wanna see those things. 
That's mostly how we pray. Go to the next verse. Give us our daily bread. I'm just gonna skip some of this. And forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. All this is gonna speak for itself. And lead us not into temptation. Do you know you can pray that God leads you not into a place that you have to have forgiveness all the time? Lead me not into temptation. Deliver me, and not just us, but deliver me, and not, let me, not just me, but us, from evil. For yours is the kingdom. It's his kingdom. Not our kingdom, it's his kingdom. And the power and the glory forever, amen. Here we go. He's given us another insight as he did on giving, as he did in prayer. Now we're gonna talk about another little insight into God's thinking process in his domain. For if you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. Now I wanna stop for a second. That is not a condition that God's gonna withhold forgiveness, right? It's not a matter of God going, oh, they're not forgiving, so I'm gonna hold forgiveness back. No, it's a way of life, yeah. right? Yeah. God, God is not holding it going, you've almost got it out of you, but there's still some in there. Yeah, it's, it was 90%, we're moving ourselves down. A little bit more and I'm gonna release it. It's not like us holding a piece of candy and your kid holding it going, can I have it? And you're, they're pulling out of your hand, you're going, not, not yet, not yet. No, 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 it's a way of life. It is a part of thinking. I have been so forgiven, I can't hold anything against you. Right? For if you forgive men your trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. Next verse says, but if you forgive them not, neither will your Father forgive you your trespasses. He's not holding it, it's not a condition, it's a way of life. That's important for you to know. It's not like God's gonna go, okay, now you met the qualifications. That's not how it works. Next verse. Moreover, when you fast, we're going into another part here. <clears throat> We've talked about giving, we're talking about prayer. This is only one chapter, Matthew 6. We've talked about giving, don't be seen of men. Prayer, go into your closet. It's not about vain repetition and lots of words. It's from the heart, it's communication from the heart. Now we, we talked about forgiveness, now we're gonna talk about fasting. Moreover, if you fast, be not as the hypocrites of, of sad, sad countenance do, for they, dis they disfigure their faces, that they may appear unto men to fast. Verily I say unto you, they have their reward. You don't do things for attention. It is not God's way. That's why Jesus came lowly. He could have come in riding on a horse. We'd have always, we were looking for him on a horse. He didn't come that way. He came lowly through a manger, right? Why did he do that? Because humility never points to you. Be thou when thou fastest, anoint thy head and wash thy face. But thou, that thou appear not unto men to fast, but unto thy father which is in a secret, and thy father which seeth in secret shall reward thee openly. Lay not up your for yourself treasures upon earth where moth and rust do corrupt and where thieves break through and steal. But lay up for your tre yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt and where, th where thieves do not break through or steal. For, here we go. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. So giving, the first one. The prayer, forgiveness, what was the second, what was the one? Fasting, and now he's talking about what is your motivation, right? What is your motivation for the things you're going after in life? Stuff, material things, is that what drives you? If it does, don't, don't, don't get your focus on things that, that, that rot away, temporary. Here's what he says, for where your treasure is, there will be your heart also. What he's saying in the first 22 verses is, in those five categories or six categories we just talked about, if you get one pick up, if you don't pick up anything else tonight, pick up this. The kingdom of God's domain, the culture, the thought process, if you were to pick yourself up right here from Huntington, West Virginia, and relocate to God's kingdom physically, the first thing you're gonna have to recognize is 
You don't do anything to be seen. It's not outward, it's inward. So you have to repent, change your mind that this outward kingdom that we try to go after really is a trick of the enemy to get you to go after stuff that falls away. And the most important thing you can do is when you repent is to change your mind to say, oh my God, God's kingdom is not out there. God's kingdom is in here. Make sense? It's important. The light of the body, he says, where your tre- heart, your treasures are, there's your heart. I, where, wherever you are treasuring, whatever your motivation is, whatever you're going after, tells people your heart, right? You don't have to, you can't hide it. You, you live it. The light of, and the church of people and pastors try to convince people, well if, you, well, if you're not giving money, there's a good chance your heart's not in it because where your treasure is, there's your heart. And people go, oh, God, I'm gonna get convicted because I'm not giving enough money. Well, because my heart must be bad because I can't write a big enough check. That has nothing to do with it. It has everything to do with here. Big or small, it's here. The light of the body is the eye. If therefore thine eye be single, I could spend an hour on this. Thy whole body shall be full of light. I'm not gonna go there. But if thine eye be evil, thy whole body shall be full of darkness. If therefore the light that is in thee be darkness, how great is that darkness? No man can, here we go. No man can serve two masters for either he will hate one and love the other or else he will hold to the one and despise (coughs) the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. Here's what he's saying. You cannot live both ways. You either focus outwardly or you focus inwardly. Your drive comes from external or your drive comes from internal. Your compass comes from out there drawing you or it's coming from here leading you. Am I making any sense now? You can't serve two masters. You will get caught in a crossfire. You'll you'll love one, hate one. And what happens is you become double-minded and then you're mad at yourself because you'll get some things right and get them some things wrong. So you feel like you're making some progress in some areas and the next thing you know, you're knocked back on your rear end going, oh my God, I don't feel like I've gotten anywhere. I mean, I feel like I'm spinning my wheels. No, go back to here. Let's go to the verse 25. Therefore I say unto you, take no thought for your life. Here we go. What you shall eat, or what you shall drink, or nor yet of the bot for your body, what shall you put on? Is not the life more than meat and the body more than raiment? Behold the fowls of the air, for they sow not, neither do they reap, nor gather into barns. Yet your heavenly Father feeds them anyway. Are they not much better? Are you not much better than them? Which of you, by taking thought, can add one cubit unto your stature? And why take you thought for raiment? Consider the lilies of the field and how they grow; they toil not, neither do they spin. And yet I say unto you that even Solomon, in all of his glory, was not arrayed like one of these. Wherefore, if God so clothe the grass of the field, which today is, and tomorrow is cast into the oven, shall, not, shall he not much more clothe you, O ye of little faith? Therefore, don't take any thought, saying, what shall we eat, or what shall we drink, wherewith shall we be clothed? For all these things did the world seek. For your heavenly Father knoweth that you need these things, but seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all those last three scriptures will be added into your life. Make sense? Make sense? You get it? Right? How do I, how do I seek the kingdom? You find out all about the king. And recognize the king's your father. Understand the constitution of the kingdom. See, when I first got saved, um, I mean, really transformed. I mean, I had a conversion. <coughs> and I lived in Ashland. And it was a, 
a stop sign that was at the end of a street, and I could come sideways to the stop sign, and it was visible, all the traffic that was coming down, it was actually 29th Street, coming this direction. So I could pull up to the stop sign, the side street, look up way in a distance and see if anybody's coming. And you know how many times I actually stopped at that stop sign when nobody was coming? Probably hardly any. Thousands. Just pull right up, you see, you just keep right on going, right? I get saved, and I pull through that stop sign one time, and the Lord stopped me. There was no cops around. And he had me back up to get and stop, come to a complete stop at that stop sign. And he was teaching me, because I was learning about the kingdom during this time, and he was teaching me that I'm not obeying the law under the law. I'm just not willing to violate, right, the culture of the government. So seeking ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, the righteousness means I'm in right standing with the government of the king. Right? I could get away with running a stop sign, but because now it's etern internal and not external, something inside of me says, don't run the stop sign. Now, I could have ran the stop sign and never got a ticket, but I wasn't trying to get away from things. I was trying not to violate the government of which I was living. So now the Ten Commandments take on a whole other rule. I'm not trying not to do those things because it's against the law. Something in my heart tells me because the kingdom of God's government is now in my heart because I have a relationship with the Father and the King. I'm learning the king is my father. My father has certain expectations for me in his government. And the more I learn of his government, the more I don't violate the rules of that government. When I do, something inside of me goes off and says, you violated the rule. I don't get myself beat up because of that. I repent and say, ah, I got that. And that can't be a part of my life. So what do I do? Once I say that and come into reconciliation with that, I'm now back in grace with the government of the kingdom of the king, which happens to be my father. Right? Ever done something wrong? You haven't seen your parents or your dad for a while, your mom, back in the day, whenever it might have been. You walk in the house you know it, but he don't know it yet, but you're feeling it. Does that just happen to me? You know what I'm talking about? You did some stuff you shouldn't have done. You come home. You're looking at him. He's looking at you. You know, but he don't know. Something inside of you is going, that's not right. Am I, amen? Can I get one? Right? You, you know, right? Now, because your heavenly father knows all things, he already knows. So rather than try to hide it from him, the best thing to do is reconcile it with him, knowing he's going to forgive you and get you back in good grace. Keep your conscience clear. Don't violate that. And the more you don't violate that, the more you stay in gracious grace with the government of your father, right? The guy has a relationship now with the son of the king. He goes out and he does some things against the rules. He didn't know, it was ignorance. He does some things in Morocco against the rules, all right? He's gonna get in trouble for that. You know who he called? He calls the son. He called the son and the son said, what'd you do? He says, man, I didn't know. And he tells him everything he's done. You know what the son did? Went to the father. And when the son went to the father, he told him everything that the, the, the man did. And the son, the man says, okay. The, the, the father says, the king says, all right, I got this. Thank you. So when charges were brought up against the man, the king had already known, knew about it. 
You know how he knew? Because the son. And the king says, I already dealt with that. It's over. You can't bring charges against him. Oh God, this will preach, guys. You can't bring charges against him because I've already dismissed the charges because I knew about the charges before you brought the charges against him. That's the king. Happened to be your father. You got in through the son. And it's in an unseen realm that now becomes seen. When are you gonna make the switch? When are we gonna make the switch? When's the world, when's the church gonna make the shift? The switch from going to try to chasing a world that's seen to being anchored in a world that's unseen. Forcing the unseen through relationship with the king of your father into the domain in this earth. That's what this is all about. And you live internal. When your conscience gets violated in here, that's the God, Jesus even said this, when, when, when you see me, the, the kingdom's with you. But when, it, when I go away, the kingdom's gonna be in you. So the government, that's why Jesus said this, he said, or God said it, he said, you know, I wrote the, 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 the laws on the tables with man's hands with, with, with Moses by the finger of God. He said, but there'll be a time come they won't be coming on tablets of stone, I'm gonna put them in your heart. So the government, the rules of God went from tables on stones to tables of your heart. So when a person comes in the kingdom, what I mean by getting into the kingdom, you are born into the kingdom. Remember, you can't come into the kingdom any other way. You have to be born. So you enter into the kingdom or born into the kingdom by your birthright. So that you're never gonna make the shift from trying to live a Christian life unless you go from God being king only to your father, the king. Amen. That has to be a paramount shift in your mind. Repent, you're the son of the king. Repent, you're the son of the king. Repent, change your mind. Quit thinking you're a peon. You're a son of the king. And when you go to him, you go boldly. And you seek first his kingdom, the unseen realm of life that we've just got all through the scripture here, through the first 20 some verses, we're five or six glimpses into the heart of the kingdom. And if you're not operating that fashion, repent, change your mind, and shift over here. If you're doing things for outward appearance, shift to do it for here, internal. If you're focused on all the things you need and need and need, don't be like the Gentiles. Your father knows you need of those things. Seek first the unseen realm and the government of God that's in your heart. Seek first to not violate your conscience. That's the kingdom of God. That's what he preached and taught. That's what got crowds going can't imagine what he's saying. This makes no sense. I thought he was coming to overthrow Rome. No, my kingdom is not as of this world. My kingdom's of an unseen world. And it's like leaven. The more you focus on it and the more you desire it and the more you enter into it, the more it becomes available and alive today in this realm. But it never goes here, there. It has to go there, here. It's conceived in the unseen and manifest in the seen. It'll never be conceived in the seen to manifest in the unseen. You give, not to get, you give here, right? I'm not praying to be heard or seen. I'm here. What violates your conscience is breaking the law of government in the kingdom. Repent. And if you really knew the father and he's not the king, he becomes your father and not just the king, you won't break the father's heart. That's when you're really dry, moving in and 
delving into the relationship with the Father. So Jesus comes to a bunch of people that lived in the United States and he tells them all, I'm taking you to Morocco and you have no frame of reference of this and you're gonna have to learn to live in a, re- in a realm where you, the king owns the land, the king has his own way of thinking, but I'm gonna introduce you to his son that's gonna lead and guide you and take you all the way to the throne and because you know the son, you'll know the father. And when he become, in fact, you're gonna get so close to the son, he's gonna make you a part of the family. They're gonna adopt you into the family. So the next time you come in to the house, after being adopted, you don't have to go in. Oh gosh. You don't have to go in and say, I'm here in the son's name. In Jesus' name, amen. Because why? I came through the door with the son. Now I'm one of the sons. Because of the relationship I have with your son, your only begotten one, I have access to you too. So I'm here in my own name because he let me come in in my own name. So after the first, after I come in, I'm not going, I'm here because of Jesus. To the father. You know what the father would say to you? The king would say to you? I already know that. You don't have to tell me that every time you come. Oh my gosh. But you'll feel that when you come in asking for stuff that's of the world. But don't ask of all that stuff. He knows you have need of all that. But seek first the kingdom of God and his rightness his intentions, his will, his thoughts, his ways, his desires. And if you don't know what those are, stay in it until you press in it. In relationship, he'll reveal them to you. And next year, you should know more about your kingdom of your father than you know right now. And sometimes it's trial and error. Sometimes you learn what he wants by what you just did he didn't want. And your conscience gets violated and you go, oh, I gotta get rid of that. That's not what he wants. I can't talk like that. I can't say that. I, I, can't, I can't be around those kind of people. You know, that, that right there is, I know people that never work, listen, got saved. And <laughs> I know a guy got literally, he got saved. Tra- I mean, just encounter with God, tears all over the place. Went out and bought a six pack of beer and got and celebrated. Then he got saved. Okay, well, he was happy. He did it before he got saved. Right? He was happy, went out and said, well, I got you, you know what everybody wanted to do? Correct him. To, you, you, now that you're saved, you don't do those things. No, no. I, no, what we, we did what we did. We introduced him to his father that happened to be the king. He desired to take that desire away. And it's not a part of his life. He doesn't do that. It's not, it's not what he, it violated his conscience after those six beers. Well, he got more than that, actually. He got six and he felt good he got, when I got more because it was a party, he got saved, okay? But after, after it all came back to himself and every, all the preachers were trying to preach to him, you don't do that. Let me tell you what happened. His conscience was violated and until he had a revelation of himself that that was not good for him and it violated the government or the righteousness of his God, his father, it was a rule on a rock instead of a rule in his heart. If it's a rule on a rock, you'll do it out of obedience. If it's a rule from heart, you'll do it out of love. I'm gonna quit with that. Stand to your feet, please. This helping you? This stuff is real. I'd rather stand up here and go, we can get it, man. Just be, oh. You gotta live this thing out there. Because when he comes, when he does return, He's coming back to establish his kingdom. It better be already established somewhere. He ain't gonna author this thing again when he came 2,000 years ago to author it. We're waiting on him to come back and start something. He, he should be coming back for something that's already started, that's growing and maturing. And the kingdom, if it's like leaven, it should be growing in all of our life. Father, in Jesus' name, unpack and unveil 
the kingdom of God to your people in language and communication that we don't understand. At this point, maybe you'll, you'll help us see it and hear it. Let us understand your communication. Let us understand your intentions and your will, your desires, your motivations, your ways. Help us to see it all. And God, those things that caused you to make up those rules, the why behind the rules, you said you put those in our hearts. If they're in our hearts, God, let them come to our mind and, and, and synchronize so we understand that we're not just trying to follow a bunch of rules and be obedient just to be obedient to some rules that displease you. Help us to be navigated by the spirit of your government, which is the kingdom of our Father that resides in each one of us. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. God bless you guys. We'll see you all Sunday morning.